Victor is uh, very cheap. So please. All right, so thank you for having me here. It's always a pleasure coming to I1. Uh, in this talk, I'd like to tell you about several projects that my group and I uh, have been doing in the past couple of years um, in developing data science tools for cosmology and string theory. I would particularly like to highlight my student, Alex Cole, who is fantastic. He's on the postdoc market this year, and I encourage you to take a closer look at his application. Now, without a doubt, cosmology is marching into a data-rich era. Um, astronomical surveys are producing an exponentially increasing amount of data in the quest to understand the origin of cosmic structures. Um, the physics we can extract from these surveys combined uh, is potentially enormous. That includes the absolute mass scale of the neutrinos, uh, the initial conditions of the cosmic structures laid out at the Big Bang, uh, the time evolution of dark energy and the distribution of dark matter. So to get a sense of the amount of data we anticipate for this experiment, uh, we can compare that with that collected at the LXC. So in the next uh, decade or so, uh, the computing need for cosmology would be similar to having several LXC but in parallel. And of course, in terms of sheer volume, uh, nothing trumps the volume of string theoretical data um, an earlier estimate of 10 to the 500 back here has been superseded by recent studies. And there's no indication that this number will stop growing. So the question is, how do we deal with this data challenge? Um, certainly, ideas from data science can help in this quest. But perhaps more interestingly, can these physics questions serve as a driver to develop new data science tools that may have even wider applicability? Now, the term big data is oftentimes used, but this may not be an accurate description of the challenge that we are facing because it is not the size, but the complexity of the data that makes extracting physics from big data sets extremely challenging. And as I will explain, uh, data has shapes, and the shapes of data matter. So for example, uh, in string theory, we have many light scalar fields that we call moduli, whose uh, vector exploitation values describe the size and the shapes of the extra dimensions. Now, uh, we refer to solutions of string theory that lives in this higher dimensional moduli space as string vacuum. In simple cases, when there are only very small number of moduli, in this case one, we can visualize the distributions on the complex plane. And there we find interesting patterns. Uh, there are clusters where string vacuum are densely populated. And there could also be topologically non-trivial features, like voids. Now, the distributions of string vacuum with additional features, for instance, and hand symmetry, can have even richer pattern. The question is, how do we recognize these patterns if the dimension of the moduli space is huge? So similar clustering and void-like features also appears in the large-scale structure of our universe, when we look at the density distributions of galaxies and clusters of galaxies. Um, Besides density distribution, we are oftentimes interested in more properties, like uh, the luminosity, the color of the galaxies, or in the case of the CMB, we are not interested only in the temperature and isotropies. We are interested also in the polarization of the CMB photons. And so incorporating these additional features would enlarge the space, the data space. Um, and so the question is, how do we recognize patterns in the higher dimensional data space? the higher dimensional data space when the dimension is large and the data is complex. So this remarkable unity of physics suggests that we may perhaps use similar tools to study both the structure of the landscape and the structure of the cosmos at the same time. Now, when the dimension of the data space is huge, we can no longer visualize the structure of data. We would like to have a more systematic tool and Topological data analysis is a tool in computational topology that allows us to systematically diagnose the shapes of data. Now, to be able to compute the shape of a discrete set of data points, which are usually the objects that we deal with with real data, um, in order to compute the shape of a discrete set of data points with some stability, we would uh, need a notion of persistence. And so the idea of topological persistence is to uh, consider a nested sequence of topological spaces and track topological features that persist as we vary the continuous parameters that label these spaces. Okay. 
Now, uh, this is not a new tool. Topological data analysis is, uh, is a branch of applied mathematics that has been widely used in other fields, for example, in uh, imaging and neuroscience and in drug design. So we can draw some analogy here. So for, ins for instance, the topology of the point clouds descri describing the chemical composition of drugs uh, have been used to test the effectiveness of uh, various structures that you design. So we may ambition using topological data analysis to um, test the effectiveness of various early universe theories in, in reproducing the observed patterns in the large scale structures and in the CMP. And one may even ambition to design using topological data analysis string models with certain desired phenomenological features. Now, oftentimes we are dealing with a rather huge data set. And um, because of the huge volume of data, uh, we cannot realistically sample or include every data point in our analysis. And in topological data analysis, a selected algorithm is oftentimes used uh, to select a subset of the data point to draw conclusions. And uh, we can, by way of analyzing the topology of data in cosmology and in string theory, test these algorithms in various uh, physical contexts. So, uh, let me briefly introduce the basic ideas of topological analysis before I could tell you what we have done. Um, now, many of you are familiar with the notion of topology for continuous spaces. Uh, the topology of a coffee mug is the same as the topology of a donut, which is different from the topology of a soccer ball. And so, manifolds with the same topology can be continuously deformed from one to the other. Uh, however, in data analysis, we are not dealing with uh, continuous spaces, but rather a discrete set of data points. Nonetheless, we could uh, represent uh, these data points in terms of something that we call syntactical complices and uh, analyze its topology in the context of syntactical homology. So what is a syntactical complex? Well, a syntactical complex is a collection of simplices. And lower dimensional simplices include uh, vertices, points like here, edges, triangle, and tetrahedra. <coughs> so in the dimensions, uh, these are all the simplices we have. So vertices, lines, triangles, and tetrahedra. Of course, if you go to high dimensional spaces, you have more complicated simplices. So a syntactical complex is a collection of simplices that are closed under picking intersections and phases of elements in the set. So it is a collection of these simplices that I drew over here. If you take any of the of two, of two of the simplices intersect, the intersection should also lies within that set. That's what we mean by a syntactical complex. Also, if a tetrahedra is included, it's a high dimensional synthesis. All the phases, like the triangle, the edges, and the vertices, are also included in your syntactical complex. Now, because the data is uh, represented in a combinatorial way, it can be easily handled by computers. So, to analyze the topology of a syntactical complex, you can compute uh, its homology. So, roughly speaking, the homology is the counting of the number of handles. Uh, this would be something that you could with continuous spaces. Uh, like in the case of continuous spaces, uh, we could define a set of Betty numbers, which counts the number of uh, connected components. This would be the zero of Betty numbers. And the first Betty number would be the counting of the number of non-trivial loops. And the pth Betty numbers would be the count with the number of non-trivial p cycles. Okay. Now, because again, the data is uh, represented in a combinatorial way, a homology calculation amounts to matrix calculations, which again can be easily handled by computers. So here I have uh, two examples. This has the Betty number, uh, zero Betty number equals to one, first Betty number equals to one, there is one non trivial one cycle, and there's one connected pieces. Here, because the phase of the triangle is filled up, uh, there's only one connected component, there's no, um, there no um, uh, non trivial one cycle. So they have different topologies. So what I, have just is, what I have just described is a way to characterize the topology of a syntactical complex. But the question is, how do we form a syntactical representation of the data in the first place? The procedure is far from unique. This is where the trickiness comes from. Uh, it's natural to associate each data point with a vertex. But we have to start making choices when it comes to connecting vertices with lines. 
So we would like to be able to have a procedure that is stable against <coughs> choices of symplectual representation and also stable against uh, perturbations of the data. If I move the point slightly a little bit, it should not change the topology, it should not change the topology of the data. We should be able to find a way to determine this uh, shape uh, without uh, having to worry about small perturbations. Okay. So a procedure that achieves this goal is known as persistent homology. Uh, the idea is to not consider a single syntactual representation of the data, but rather consider a family of syntactual representations. You vary the syntactual representation of data with some parameters that we call the filtration parameter. Um, as you vary the filtration, you will find that some topological features uh, um, appear, and some topological features disappear. And so we refer to these instances as the birth and the death. <coughs> now, persistent homology tracks the birth and death of each distinct topological features. And the intuition that you might want to keep in mind is that uh, real topological features persist. So these are features that survive as you vary the parameter, whereas short-lived features are noise. So when you vary the parameter, you find that some topology uh, change, changes, then this is not the actual uh, uh, real physical result the one that persists over a long range of uh, subtraction of the uh, treasure parameter will be the one that you keep. Now it's perhaps uh, a lot easier to illustrate this with an example instead of talking about generalities. So here I have a whole bunch of points that are sampled from an analyst. Okay. So uh, we are human, and if you look at this picture, you could easily recognize that uh, this data set has a clear topological character. There is a non-trivial one cycle, there's a loop here, and there's one connected pieces. Now, you can see how persistent homology could uh, describe the data's topology in a systematic way. Okay, so we uh, associate each data point with a vertex, and how do we connect the vertices with edges? So we fatten the points to spheres with a given radius. So you can think of the radius as a filtration parameter. And uh, two vertices whose uh, spheres overlap would be connected by a point, by, by a line. Okay. So if the spheres are far enough from each other, you don't connect them by a line, but if the spheres overlap, you draw a line. And um, higher dimensional synthesis are included if all the faces are. So here, the, if you have the vertices and the line, uh, the higher dimensional um, um, uh, synth synth uh, synthesis, like in this case, the triangle will be fewer. So this is how you get your syntactical representation for that given filtration parameter. So now you could uh, vary your filtration parameter further and make this be a bigger. Then you find that different edges and different triangles contribute to um, the syntactical complex. So some topological features uh, appear and some of them die in this process. As you increase your filtration parameter further, you get uh, one connected piece. Moreover, there's a non-trivial one cycle that survives. Okay. So, now, um, this is a lower dimensional example. So if you imagine that you are now dealing with uh, hundreds of dimensions of data space, you would like to have a more systematic tool to be able to visualize this topology. Okay. So to visualize the persistent homology, we could introduce tools known as barcodes and persistent diagrams and they carry similar information. These are just two different ways of representing the persistent homology of the data. So uh, each horizontal lines in the barcodes represent an independent cycle that contributes to a particular fatty numbers. So in simple lower dimensional examples, you can enumerate them. So this would be the persist this would be the barcodes for fatty number zero, fatty number one, fatty number two, and so on. And um, uh, each horizontal line begins at the moment when the cycle was born, and it ends at the moment when the cycle dies. Okay. So now if you want to know what is the topology for a given filtration parameter, you draw vertical lines and count the intersections. So that would be a number of zero cycles that uh, exist for a given filtration parameter, likewise for the one cycle, two cycle, and so on. So these are barcodes, just like the barcodes that you find in supermarkets it characterize the topology of the data set. Now, persistent diagram is just a different way to represent the data. 
instead of uh, drawing horizontal lines, you can draw uh, scatter plots. Each point on the scatter plot labels the moment when the cycle was born. So the x-axis is the time or the filtration parameter at which the cycle uh, was born. And the y-axis labels the moment when it dies. Okay. So now if you want to count the topology for a given filtration parameter, you count the number of living cycles, the ones that have been born but have not yet died, which means you count the number of points in the upper left quadrant. So I would like to make one point here, which turned out to be useful later on. And the point is, our persistent diagrams contains more information than just counting of Betty numbers as a filtration, as the function of the filtration parameter, something that people call a Betty number curve. And here I cook up two examples. On the left, you have two different sequence of sequences of birth and death. Uh, there are only three cycles that are being uh, that are being produced and die at some point. They they live at diff they uh, they were born at different moment in time and they die at different moment in time. But both persistent diagrams give rise to the same Betty number as a function of the filtration parameter. So that this is a much more degenerate uh, uh, a set of information you can extract, you would be able to unpack more of the data by looking at the persistent diagram or the barcodes that just looking at the Betty number curve itself. Turns out we have exploited this to improve the cosmological constraints on non gaussian entities from uh, CMB data and last structure that I'm now going to turn to. So we can now apply this uh, <coughs> techniques in the five of the topology to cosmology. So uh, we have inflation in mind in our study. Uh, although the method can be applied to alternative theories as well, uh, as you know, inflation predicts an almost scale invariant, almost Gaussian uh, spectrum of uh, primordial curvature perturbation. Um, this uh, curvature perturbation sources temperature and isotropies in the CMB, as well as inhomogeneity in the large scale structure. Now, different models of inflation give you different patterns of anisotropies different patterns of these curvature perturbations. And so far, it's fair to say that the, the taxonomy of the inflation model has mostly de been done through only two of their observables, namely something that we call the spectral index uh, and the tensor to scalar ratio. The spectral index tells you the deviation of the spectral cone scale invariance is very close to one. Um, now, uh, we may be able to extract more information from uh, these anisotropies than just these two numbers. Uh, the lowest order correlation you can extract from this anisotropies is the power spectrum, which is the two-point function of the curvature perturbation. And the deviation from scale invariance is parameterized by this uh, spectral index. Ns minus 1, and Ns is exactly 1, the spectrum is scale invariant. Uh, although we have now very strong evidence for the 5 sigma that the spectrum is not exactly scale invariant. Uh, for a Gaussian theory, the two-point function is all you need. All the higher point functions are dictated by the two point functions. Uh, however, um, the inflationary perturbation is not exactly Gaussian. Uh, the leading non Gaussian entity is the three point function, or cosmologists sometimes call the bias spectrum. Now, um, the um, uh, bias spectrum, uh, you can use arguments based on scaling and symmetries to argue that this three-point correlation functions of the temperature and isotropies <coughs> is completely, ca completely characterized by overall size that we oftentimes call FNL that appears in the talks yesterday, <coughs> and also a two-variable shape function. Uh, that's the reason why we call it a bias spectrum, because it is not a function of only one momentum, it's a function of two momentum. So why is that the case? Well, we can always use scaling to scale one of the momentum to have magnitude one. And conservation, translation invariant basically means that the sum of the momentum has to be equal to zero, so they form a triangle. And so the triangle is completely fixed by the magnitude of the remaining uh, two momentum. <coughs> so the unknown for this by spectrum would be how big it is, characterized by this F and L parameter, and also what is this shape function. And as you can see, non gaussian entities provide a more powerful discriminator of models because uh, it gives us a functional worth of information and not just a number like the spectral index. So the bias spectrum for a very wide class of inflation model has been computed. Uh, it was shown to be characterized by five numbers. 
So five parameters dictate the spectrum of single field uh, inflationary model. And I should say that this class of models extend uh, beyond slow-world inflation. That includes more exotic models of inflation, like uh, DPI inflation, where the kinetic time plays a big role. Now, uh, I didn't show you the functional form of this uh, I spectrum. It's a rather messy function. But by eyeballing the functions, you could recognize two shapes. One of them is called the local shape that was also mentioned yesterday. Uh, this is called the local shape, and it is peak at the squeeze limit when one of the momentum is small, or in the limit when it goes to zero. There is another shape that uh, is known as the collateral shape. It peaks at a different kinematic regime. It peaks when all the momenta are comparable. Now, uh, for the experts in the audience, you may ask, what about the orthogonal shape? Some people talk about this orthogonal shape when they compare the cloud data. Well, um, while the orthogonal shape um, is uh, orthogonal to these two shapes shown here um, in the sense of function space, um, it looks qualitatively the same as the equilateral shape. So by eyeballing, you will not be able to tell the difference between this orthogonal, orthogonal shape of the Gaussian entity, which has a functional form different from that of the equilateral shape. It all looks uh, very similar. So this brings up the point that uh, certain subcode by uh, distinct features of non gaussianity may be very difficult to pick up um, from uh, pattern, recogni uh, pattern recognition tools in uh, machine learning. OK, now uh, more complicated models can give rise to other shapes. Uh, for example, if the initial conditions of inflation is not the usual hard hawking state, or if the potential is not smooth but is oscillatory, like in axiom monotropy model, or if there are additional fields besides the infrequent that participates during inflation, like that one that I talked about yesterday, uh, the shape of non gaussianity would fall outside the classification that I described earlier. So like scattered amplitude in particle physics, these non gaussian features could reveal to us the interactions governing the early universe. That's why they're interesting. Uh, now in particle physics, uh, one oftentimes uses different uh, tools uh, or different uh, algorithms to search for new particles. Sometimes we look for bumps, sometimes we look for missing energy. So uh, similarly, uh, we may want to use different strategies to look for different shapes of non gaussian Some of the shapes are better determined using traditional methods. Some of the other shapes may be better determined using the techniques that I'm going to describe. Okay. So one way to detect or constrain non gaussianity is to fit the data with some known templates of functions that are computed from theory. If you have your favorite inflation model, you can compute this bias spectrum, and you can see how well the data fits with, the, with this template by uh, projecting the data um, uh, in the sense of distribution into these known templates. Um, however, there are shapes uh, that are quite hard to find using this template fitting method. For instance, this resonance shape, this oscillatory shape, has zero overlap with most of the templates. It's oscillatory, so it has uh, very little overlap. So they are very hard to find by fitting templates. Um, um, on the other hand, there have also been other approaches, uh, a mixed geometrical topological approach known as Minkowski functional that can be used to constrain non Gaussian energy. So for, for the CMB, the Minkowski functional basically amounts to the area fractions, the length of the boundaries, and also the genus, which is the topological features of the expression set. And combining template fitting with uh, this geometrical and topological approach, the current power of non-Gaussian energy, uh, experimental power of non-Gaussian energy is given as follows. Depending on what shapes of non-Gaussian energy, we are getting a bar somewhat uh, differently. The local shape is better constrained. It's about 5. Error is about 5 or 6. Uh, whereas for the collateral shape, the constraint is less restricted. <coughs> so are there other ways to tease out these subtle signals of non gaussianity Well, we decided to take a new look at this problem uh, using topological data analysis. So we will first start with uh, the CMB. Uh, the topology is simple because the temperature map is a two-dimensional map. So the only topology you can talk about would be connected components and loops, nothing else. And we are currently working on the last scale structure uh, simulations and see how well this method uh, can constrain the non-Gaussian parameter. There you have more complicated topologies. 
So in the case of the CIP, uh, this is a cartoon version of the temperature map. Uh, the temperature map is color coded. The hot uh, spots are red in color. And now the temperature here is our filtration parameters. We want to study the topology as a function of the temperature. They have a very small temperature variation of the order of 10 to the minus 5. And so we could uh, look at the sublevel set, which is a set of points whose temperature is below a certain value. And they are mapped in black here. So early in the filtration, when your temperature parameter is low, you see that there are many co uh, distinct connected components and not so many loops. As you increase the filtration parameter, you see that formally distinct components are not connected to each other, and more loops are formed. And finally, as you vary the, the filtration parameter further, you get uh, you know, basically one connected piece, and many loops are filled in as you vary the filtration parameter towards the maximum value. So we would like to be able to extract topological features from this temperature amount. And as a first step, we carry out this analysis only for the local shape, uh, although we have other shapes in our pipelines. And so um, you could uh, calculate the persistent diagram. Since you have a set of persistent diagrams as a function of the temperature, you could uh, calculate the persistent diagrams for models with different non gaussian energy in them and use that to compute the likelihood function. Uh, maybe for this audience, you're not exactly too interested in how we did it. The upshot is when, when the dust settles, you find that uh, the um, persistent uh, diagram gives you a stronger statistics than some of the statistical measures that have been introduced previously in the study of the CFD non Gaussian energy, known as the Kamsky functionals of it or the Redding number curves. Uh, you could read the one sigma error bar here. Uh, if you calculate something uh, based on the betting number curve, you find that the error bar is about 60, whereas if you use persistent diagram, the error bar is shrunk by at least a factor of two. Uh, now, a uh, one sigma error bar of uh, about 36 for low code on Gaussian energy does not look very impressive. If you remember, I showed you earlier that the error bar from fitting templates is about 6, 5.7 or 6, for low code shapes of non Gaussian energy. Uh, but keep in mind, that the temperature maps that we use have a very low resolution. Uh, these are simulations that were made before WMAP. And so now with uh, the resolution of Fun, uh, we should have uh, studied this with using more uh, higher resolution temperature maps that are all data made for Fun. But you can do a simple back of the envelope estimate. The error bar should go to like the inverse square root of the number of votes, since you have a lot more pixels in the Fun data. Um, it is conceivable that the error bars will be comparable when you use the higher resolution temperature maps. But more importantly, and that's the point that I emphasized earlier, for non-Gaussian shapes that are poorly constrained from, by its fitting templates, like the oscillatory shapes for axial monotary uh, inflationary model, uh, persistent homology may give us a more sensitive uh, measure. Okay, so now we could try to apply similar techniques to the to explore the structure of the landscape. Um, now, in simple cases, when simple means there are only very few moduli, in this case there's only one, uh, you find that the vacuum distribution exhibits some pattern. Uh, there are voids, uh, there are loops in which uh, you don't find any vacuum in between, there are loops, but inside the void at the center, there is a huge degeneracy of vacuum. This is the uh, vacuum distributions for the axial dilettante. And one would be interested in uh, understanding whether this topological feature is general, namely a high degree of topological complexity, meaning that you have to do, point us to um, a large number of bacteria at the center, or perhaps even point us to the region of the landscape uh, where uh, there are bacteria with some special properties. So persistent homology is precisely a tool to compute the topological complexity. So if you are looking at a very high dimensional modular space, you can no longer visualize the distributions. But you can still compute the persistent homology to uh, uncover whether there are some non-trivial topological features. So as a warm-up, let's consider a particularly simple example where we can already visualize the vacuum distribution as in the first place. Uh, this is an example where you have only <coughs> a single uh, modulus. 
So if you compactify a uh, train theory on a rigid color VR, because the internal space is rigid, there's only one modulus, namely the axial dilaton. There's no modulus associated with the size and the shape of the extra dimensions. And so um, um, you could represent the moduli space on the complex plane, since one modulus is two dimensional, you could represent the distribution on a two-dimensional plane, on a two-dimensional plane. Uh, however, we have to be careful because a lot of these vectors are related by, are gauge related. Uh, so we should really model the complex plane by the action of the symmetry, which in this case is SL2C. At the end of the day, this is what we find. Um, and uh, if we don't look at the distribution on the complex plane itself, but rather at the persistent diagram, you find that there are some relatively long-lived one-dimensional cycles. And this relatively long-lived one-dimensional cycles corresponds to voids in the vector distributions. Their presence implies that for a certain value of the filtration product, the non-trivial one cycle would form. This one cycles come in different sizes. Uh, some uh, the, the long lived cycles corresponds to bigger ones because it takes a bigger filtration parameter to fill up the hole. And on the other hand, the huge degeneracy of vacuum at the center would correspond to the uh, persistent homology for the zero cycle. And if you have a very good eyesight, you can see that uh, some of the zero cycles uh, disappear at roughly the same filtration parameter as the one cycle. And this correlated depth is uh, easy to understand. Uh, when the filtration parameter is big enough to fill up the void, the vertices on the edge of the void can now be connected to that at the center. So the depth of the one cycle is correlated with the depth of the zero cycle. And uh, in topological data analysis, there is a concept known as persistent pairing that allows us systematically to analyze this correlation. So this is an example where we can um, learn something not just by looking at the individual patterns of the persistent diagram, but also at how they correlate it. And with this example, we can up the level of difficulty and consider high dimensional examples. So this Calabial space has a lot of moduli, but fortunately, there's also a huge symmetry group. And so you could argue that the only moduli invariant under this discrete symmetry group uh, contains that there are, are only two. There are only two of them. One of them is the axial dilaton, and the other is the modulus that I call psi. Now, this is already an example where you cannot visualize. This is a four-dimensional space data. If you project the data onto the psi plane, you see lots of vector cluster at the center. And uh, topological data analysis would allow us to systematically diagnose the vacuum structure without having to projection. When you project, some information is lost. <coughs> So you could identify this cluster by using the density of vector as a filtration parameter. So the cluster, uh, the sublevel sub set with these filtration parameters give you a void. Uh, it excites a void. And so you could identify either the cluster by looking at the <coughs> number density of them, or when you use the density of vector as a filtration, you can identify them by looking at these holes. And so the question is whether this particular feature survived in the full modular space and whether there are some uh, uh, additional higher dimensional topological features that we miss uh, by projecting into a soft space. So again, to make the long story short, we find that there are some long, there's a long-lived one cycle that persists in the full modular space, uh, but there are no high dimensional, non-trivial, long-lived topological features, which means that the clustering, even though it happens at a point in the, in the projected space, it actually does not cluster at a point. The vector does not cluster at a point, but they cluster around more like a city. Okay, so uh, I will be quick here. Uh, you could also ask, uh, what happens when you put additional physical requirements on the set of vector? So what I have described so far are generic vector. And um, it's interesting to see whether imposing additional physical requirements can change the topology of the data. So again, we can illustrate this with an example with two moduli. Um, on the left, I have the distributions of vacuum. These are generic vacuum. I don't impose any conditions on them. On the right, I have the distributions of vacuum uh, with the additional requirement that has a vanishing superpotential. And for the particle physics uh, uh, um, experts in the, in the audience, this restriction on vacuum with a vanishing superpotential is motivated by the Nelson cycle theorem of dynamical supersymmetry breaking. The vanishing of the superpotential implies the existence of an R symmetry. 
And so by eyeballing, you see that these are that these have different features. And how do we detect these different patterns by topological data analysis? We find that the distribution of generic vector uh, gives you this persistent diagram, whereas the ones that are special, the ones that satisfy uh, vanishing superpotential criteria, looks like this. And there are some high dimensional topological features that appear in the restricted set of vacuum, but not in the generic set. So requiring more refined physical properties can increase the topological complexity, which is the point I was making earlier. Um, topological complex situations point us to interesting or perhaps higher density region of the landscape. Now, uh, in general, we have hundreds of moduli. We can ask realistically include all of them as vertices in our point cloud. And in TDA, there are well-developed well algorithms to sample the topology of the data. And different algorithms have their own strength abilities and weaknesses. And we could uh, test this algorithm using the string vector data. It's fair to say that we have learned quite a big deal about the landscape, just knowing how to count. But uh, perhaps more can be understood if we could also recognize shapes and patterns. But what if our goal is not to map out the shape of the entire landscape, but to um, cherry pick the optimal solutions in the huge landscape. So this brings us to uh, genetic algorithms. So how do we effectively search for strain vacuum with certain desired properties, maybe with realistic particle physics spectrum, or a small cosmological constant, small cup plane, large axon decay constant, and so on. Uh, turn out nature has already given us a, a solution, and that is evolution. So through mating and uh, mutation, uh, living organisms evolve and generically become fitter than the ancestors. So the idea of genetic algorithm is to start with a population, in this case, a set of string vacuum. So we can choose, say, a thousand string vacuum to begin, and allow them to breed and mutate, just like in nature, to obtain a fifth population. So what we have shown in the recent work is that uh, this genetic algorithm can be used to uh, significantly speed up the search for optimal solutions in the landscape. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't go into details. Let me conclude. I'm happy to tell you more offline if you are interested. So we have seen a remarkable um, convergence of ideas uh, theoretical tools such as uh, topological data analysis, genetic algorithms, and machine learning has been applied to a wide variety of fields, uh, including biology, cosmology, and string theory. Uh, we have shown that uh, topological data analysis can uh, significantly improve the constraints on primordial non-Gaussianity. And we have demonstrated that similar tools can be used to analyze the structure of the landscape. Uh, and finally, uh, I just briefly mentioned that uh, genetic algorithms combined with topological analysis can significantly improve the, the speed for the search of optimal solutions in the landscape. So let me just stop here. Thank you for your attention. Question? Yeah. So uh, for the for the oscillatory uh, signals, uh, so in principle, I can have a, have a template yeah. that uh, uh, just have those, uh, those things. So is, is there any uh, particular reason that this uh, this algorithm will be better? In yeah, so, so it, it, is, it does not depend on the template. That's right. So I think that the, the strength of fitting data with templates is you know what you get. And obviously, you do better. So if you have only single field inflation model, the thing you would do is to try to fit the data as much as possible. And now that we know there are a lot more shapes, uh, even single field inflation has uh, five parameters, so there are a lot more shapes for just to use. Uh, what's unfortunate about oscillatory shape is, unless you keep right on, if you do Fourier analysis, you just basically kill uh, all the overlap. So what people do in fitting data is they compute this uh, overlap of the data with the templates. And the overlap is zero if the oscillatory functions overlap with basically any templates, unless you pick precisely the right one. So this has always been a very difficult shape to detect. Uh, but the, uh, with the methods that I was outlining does not rely on a given template. Uh, it's probably better in detecting whether Gaussian exists or not exists, but it's harder to pinpoint the shape precisely. So they have 
also the weakness, which is there are many shapes that are not Gaussian. Uh, there's only one uh, Gaussian uh, template, but there are infinitely many non Gaussian templates. Okay. Okay, no uh, <coughs> I'm thinking about if you can use this to test uh, or to verify statistically the weak gravity contraction. Yeah, so, so do the mutation. Okay, so, uh, so this is sort of hidden here. So uh, we are working on using genetic algorithms to maximize the decay constant. So that's one version of the weak gravity conjecture. Uh, as was mentioned by Q and yesterday, the weak gravity conjecture requires the decay constant to be subplotted. So in a high dimensional axion space, you could try to find directions that have the uh, super pumping field range. Uh, but uh, how do we find the longest field range possible in the high dimensional field space? So just like uh, maximizing height in human population, you can start with a population with already a PK constant and try to breed them and produce the next generations that have bigger and bigger PK constant. You can see whether you hit the wall, in which case there may be an indication that the weak variable conjecture is right, that you cannot go beyond the particle value. Or you can just go on forever, in which case you can find a counterexample to, to the weak variable conjecture. There's no question? There is no more question. Let's send the speaker again. Thank you.